So, as uh, you've been told, I work for Friends of the Earth Europe, and I used to work before in Corporate Europe Observatory, a lovely watchdog. And maybe you don't really know how it works. Friends of the Earth Europe is, if any of you is from Germany, is Bund, for instance, in Germany, or it's Milieu Defense in the Netherlands. So it's um, national organizations, and we represent them in Brussels. So I kind of, I'm the voice of all those organizations when I speak to European decision makers. I work specifically on trade agreements and investment agreements, because this is a competence of the European Union. So. The Netherlands, France, Germany doesn't uh, negotiate a trade agreement anymore. It goes for the European Union. The same for investment. Um, so I'm obviously going to give you a critical perspective. You, you'll see along the way that I, I have a certain opinion. We have a certain opinion in the organization, but I've tried to be as neutral as possible in the beginning to give you the picture, the history, what we're talking about. And I've also, I know some of you come from outside Europe, so I've also tried to give you a more global perspective. But I'm, I work in Brussels, so I still have a very European focus. If anything you don't understand or any questions you have, please don't hesitate to stop me. My glasses broke this morning, so if I don't see your hand, just put it a bit there and higher and I'll see you. Um, so ISDS. ISDS stands for Investor State Dispute Settlement. Um, what is it? <laughs> it's basically the possibility for an investor to be able to sue a state. And when I say a state, there's three different things that an investor can uh, sue the state for. For a new law, for a new decree, or for a court decision. The basis of this is the investment treaty. So you have two countries, um, let's say Uruguay and Switzerland. Those two countries have a treaty between themselves. This treaty gives the rights to Swiss investors in Uruguay or European investors in Switzerland. So this is rights. This is a treaty that gives you rights. And in this treaty, you don't only have rights, you also have a court, an enforcement system, that gives you a way to enforce those rights above the state in the international arena. And that's where you see you have an investor that can sue the state. But not at the national level, at the international level. And as you can see, it's a one-way system. So you only have rights for investors. So the state can never sue the investor. It's only the investor that sues the state. It happens at the international level. And it happens in institutions like ICSID in the World Bank. Or you also have one in, you have the International Chamber of Commerce in Stockholm. So it happens um, in private areas. And the arbitrators, as you'll see along the way, on, I don't have a fixed salary, you know, they paid by the case. Um, where does this come from? Why did countries actually start signing those treaties to give protection to investors? Um, this actually has a long history. If we go back to the colonial area, if, um, for instance, British economic interests, they, they felt they were threatened, at this time, during the colonial area, or even before that, the British Empire would use force. No? It's what we, use, we call gunboat diplomacy. So if it's economic interests for not being respected, usually what we have gunboat diplomacy. So you bring the army, you start putting pressure. So the states really try to enforce the rights of its investors abroad. And then you had the colonial area. And then at the end of the colonial area, a lot of Norman countries, a lot of the colonizers, the former colonizers, they were actually a bit worried about what would happen with the investment in their former colonies, but also just in the developing world in general. So they start pushing for those treaties. The first one you have is in 59. It's Germany and Pakistan. So that Germany was investing in Pakistan in 59, and at, those, at this time it wasn't stable. And Germany also was fearing that Pakistan could go Soviet, could go communist. So they were worried that its investment could be expropriated without compensation. So that also explains why the, those treaties were put in place. Ten years later, there's also another treaty between the former colonial power and the former colony, Netherlands and Indonesia. And here you have the same thing. You have rights for Dutch investors in Indonesia and Indonesian investors in the Netherlands. Obviously, looking at the economic relationship, it was mostly for Dutch investors in Indonesia. And what it has, it has the first investment state dispute settlement. So for the first time, you have a treaty that gives this tribunal, this international tribunal, 
to the investors. And then we'll see that this kind of becomes the fashion. You see more and more of those treaties being signed, mostly between developed and developing countries. But there's a new thing happening in the, in the 90s, it's NAFTA. It's the North American Free Trade Agreement. And in this North American Free Trade Agreement, you also have an investor state dispute settlement. And it's the first time that you have this mechanism between developed countries. As you know, Trump is not a big fan of NAFTA. He did a new NAFTA, USMCA, or called NAFTA.2.0. That was negotiated last year, finalized not last year. It has to go for Congress now, so see what happened. In this new NAFTA, you only have investment state dispute settlement between Mexico and the U.S. You don't have any more between the U.S. and Canada, so the fashion is being reversed in a way. That's to give you the history. This, here you can see more in picture what it means. This is figures from UNCTAD, it's the UN Commission on Trade and Development. Um, you can see the numbers of them, so you see a, there's a decrease now, but there's more than 3,339 of those treaties being signed. I call them bilateral investment treaty, UNCTAD calls them international investment agreements. We're talking about the same thing, really. And here what you have is the number of cases. When I say a US, an ISDS case is when a company sues a state. And here you see that obviously there's more and more treaties, so more possibilities for suing. But also this, it becomes a booming industry. And you see at the end of, of 2017, we have 855 of those cases. Known cases, they're not always known. They don't have to be published. So you don't always, there might be more, we don't know about this. But you clearly see that a, there was a clear tendency in the 90s to sign more of those treaties, and what happened next is that there's more and more cases around the world. So what is ICSIP? What is it? The application? I, I, yes, that's what... No, I, ICSID? ICSID uh, is the World Bank um, Investment State Dispute Settlement Court. So the World Bank has a special court inside to do those cases, and you see it's mostly ICSID, but you can do it. Uh, you can do it in Europe, and you can do it in other places as well. Right. And ICSID is a, has a has a history because ICSID was not very popular among the developing countries, and it, the first Secretary General of ICSID actually pushed very hard in order to have a lot of those arbitration happening in ICSID. Um, so um, when in those cases, what we have is we have. Um, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll do it we'll show it this way. That might be easier for you. Francesca, if you will be Uruguay, and Monica? Luisa. <laughs> Uruguay, I'm Philip Morris, and you're the arbitrator, right? Basically, what happens if, as, as Philip Morris, I go to a law firm, I send a letter to Uruguay, and I say, I believe that your new tobacco legislation goes against the rights that I have on a treaty that we have between Switzerland and Uruguay. I therefore want to enforce them. I'm suing you at the international level. So I have a lawyer, I'm Philip Morris. You, as Uruguay, the only thing you can do is also go to a law firm and start looking for a lawyer. And then between Uruguay and Philip Morris, you choose three arbitrators that also come from the legal industry are also paid by the hour or by the day. So we have a tribunal of three arbitrators. Two of them, so actually I choose one, you choose one, and the third one is chosen by the institution. Clearly there's a lot of lawyers involved here, um, and they are usually very well paid. And this is what I want to show you after this, is the entire money and the business there is behind those cases. And um, this is a research that uh, you might have read because I did send a lot of those articles. It's, he's called Gerson Harton and he's a legal professor in Canada. And he's looked at how much money the, um, the legal industry is making out of this. And it's 8 million US dollar per case. That's his estimate. If you look at UNCTAD and the OECD, they say between 5 and 8 uh, in the legal fees. So it's a lot of money. And this is important to remember because this is also what Uruguay will have to pay in order to defend themselves. So it, it does actually have a really impact on developing countries because it's a huge amount of money. 
And when you and what you see a lot is you have a lot of arbitrators that would also be teaching in universities, but that could also be lawyers in another case representing a company or a country. <coughs> and you also see negotiators that then go to this industry. And there's so much money to be made, obviously, that this is understandable, but it does really bring questions of conflict of interest or independence. I will maybe show you better how it works, then you can, I want to give you some illustration that might help. Um, so here, this is a report that was made about the Energy Charter Treaty. It's a treaty that has ISDS between all the countries that signed it. And um, if you look at the arbitrators, you realize that in there's been a small club, so in this case, there's 25 arbitrators that have been 45% of all the cases. You can see the details here. And you have a very nice quote. Here you have the arbitrator. I'm going to try and use this. Uh, yeah, but I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> you have Ponce that's been used in a lot of those cases. And uh, there's an investor that talked to him, that, that yeah, described him as uh, the claim will now be a walk in the park because Poncel is the arbitrator. And so you see this, it's a very close club, but it's also a, a club and it's a lot of money. So there's, an, there's a case that's been made against Russia. It was Yukos against Russia, and they want 1.7 million for this case, the arbitrator. That's, that's clearly a a lot of money involved there. I want to show you also um, UNCITRAL is the UN Center for International Trade and Arbitration Law and it has an academic forum and we've done a research about who is in that forum. So it uses KUMO. It's quite complex. It should um, work yeah, here we go. And what you see is that there's also in this academic forum quite a, some researchers that have economic impacts. So you have, um, I'm looking for law firms. Here you go, this for instance is a law firms. Um, and then you find a big one. Sorry, I regret having used this because it is actually much more complicated than I thought at the beginning. Um, for instance, here you have um, Sharon and, and, and Sterling, and you see that there's a lot of academics that actually also are lawyers in this law firm that benefits from the system. The idea that we wanted to show here, although maybe it's not that well made, is that you actually have a lot of people in this academic forum teaching as academics in university, but also giving their opinion in UNCITRAL as academics, who are also actually practitioners, so who also have a financial interest in the system. And it's actually quite uh, common, which really again poses the questions of whether those arbitrators and those lawyers are really free of conflict of interest. Um, another one that is very well known as an arbitrator is called Yves Fortier. He was really, really big at that time. He's been a very big arbitrator in the 80s and 90s. And then he became Canada, Canadian ambassador to the UN, and, the, and he was a permanent representative to the UN in New York of Canada. So he was very, also very close to the political world. And you see in other law firms, for instance, this one is called Sidley Austin. It's a really big law firm as well that so it's been in the case, for instance, that I said about Philip Morris and Uruguay. Philip Morris was represented by Sidley Austin. And now in Sidley Austin, you have the former US ambassador to the EU. So you also have quite a lot of political connections. So you really have academic, political, and financial connections in this very, in this community. But now let's go to the, what really, really makes us as investors, as investment, um, geeks we care about is the cases. <laughs> That's where I can maybe illustrate better my point. 
Um, is anyone from Germany? I heard German, I knew. Yeah, okay. So you all know Vattenfall. Yes, okay. It's a Swedish energy company. It's a very big power operator in, in Germany. Vattenfall has been suing Germany twice. The first time, it's a story about Hamburg. Hamburg had elections. There was a new uh, mayor and a new council. And at the same time, Vattenfall was building a power plant uh, in the north of the city of Hamburg, around next to the help. And in this power plant, obviously, it was, they were going to reject water in the river. And a new councillor asked them to clean the water more before it sent back to the river. Vattenfall didn't want that, because it created a new investment that was not planned at the beginning. He refused to do it, and it sued Germany under the uh, Energy Charter Treaty on an ISDS. When the letters start arriving, and the amount of money it costs to defend itself start arriving in the city of Hamburg, they decided to drop it. They said, okay, forget about it, just keep going with the original plan. And now what we have, we have the European Commission that is suing Germany, because in this part of Germany, the water is so polluted that it doesn't respect the natural habitat directives anymore. So the fishes, and there's not enough fishes and not enough birds anymore in this area because it's too polluted. It's, that's the first time that Vattenfall uses ISDS. The second time it's going to use it, it's after the Fukushima disaster. Mrs. Merkel goes to Parliament and she says, Germany's going to phase out nuclear power. That doesn't mean that it's going to close the nuclear stations tomorrow. It means that it won't renew any contract of nuclear power stations. Vattenfall comes again because it operates nuclear power stations and it say, we're going to sue you. And this is ongoing. It's ongoing. Uh, Vattenfall is asking for, um, um, it's, I can't remember, it's more than billions, but until it's 4.7 billion euros for compensation for future lost profit. Because what you have to realize is in the treaty, you're protected as an investor from expropriation which is fair, I mean, no one wants to be expropriated. But you're also protected from indirect expropriation, and you're protected from any loss of future lost profit. So Vattenfall, what it reclaims, is all the money it would have gained if its contract would have been extended. So we're not only talking about the money that it's losing now, we're talking about the, the money that they were expecting to make, that they have to be compensated. And until now, Germany has been sued for the past two, three years by Vattenfall, and it's paying a lot of money to lawyers to, to defend itself. And if it loses, it will be 4.7 billion. This case has been used a lot, obviously, because it happens in Germany, and it was in a way there was a big debate about TTIP, the argument between the US and the EU, and then CETA about Canada and the EU. Obviously, when we were trying to explain what is ISDS, it was very difficult if you have only five minutes. So we've used that uh, example a lot, the uh, Vattenfall one. But there's a quite a lot of examples of countries being sued. We know that Germany has a third case coming, but that's the only thing we know. We don't know about what, who, or when, or how much. There's also another case. This case this time is in Italy. Um, Italy had done some research into oil in the sea. And Rockhopper did start doing some research, uh, exploration of oil to, in order to build oil platforms. But there's a new government coming in Italy, and they decided that uh, above a certain distance, there should be no oil platform. They're trying to protect the, the sea, basically the close sea. So they say, no, no oil platform is too close to the sea. Now you can't do this anymore. Rockhopper is suing Italy. And it's suing Italy at the time when Italy, because it had been sued so much, actually left the European Charter Treaty. So the treaty, Italy has left it, but the treaty has what we call a sunset clause. It means that even if you leave it, you can still be sued for 20 years for all the investment that started before you left the treaty. So now Rockhopper is suing Italy because it cannot build its oil platforms. And again, this is ongoing, it will take time, it will take a lot of money from Italy. I know some of, I've been before here and there were quite a lot of Latin American students, so I also wanted to show you some um, figures from Latin America. You can see them here. 
There's a very famous case in Latin America. It's against Ecuador. Um, anyone from Ecuador? Ah, okay. Do you know it then? I guess <laughs> um, there was, So Chevron, Chevron Texaco, was exploring oil in the Amazonian forest in Ecuador. And there was a leak and it was very polluted. And the ways of draining were also contested. Ecuador did ask Chevron to clean up and gave a fee to Chevron to actually clean well, the mess it made in the Ecuadorian forest. Chevron refused to pay this. Then there was lots of legal cases around the world of victims of this pollution. What Chevron did is it used ISDS. It went to the international level and it sued Ecuador and it won. Now, Ecuador has to pay because it asked Chevron to clean what happened in the Amazonian forest. I know the story is much more complicated. I've, I've, uh, Synchronize ever, but I'm, I'm happy to say more after if you want. The point I'm trying to show is that it gives the rights to a, an investor to actually choose a system. You know, at some point Chevron refused to go through national courts, and it was allowed to get a separate international system, uh, which Ecuador was not allowed to. And the reason also why I'm telling you about Chevron is because here what you have is an official document from the European Commission. Uh, I don't have my glasses. <laughs> 2014, we have, so, and um, what we do in Friends of the Earth Europe is we often ask for official minutes of meetings. So this is something I got from DG Trade, the trade negotiators of the Commission. It, it's a meeting between the Vice President in Chevron and the European Commission. And here you have Chevron saying that um, they only used ISDS once against Ecuador, but they actually need ISDS. It's important as it acts as a deterrent. And this is really important because in all the cases that I might show you about, and all the, the numbers and, and the, the, the cases, there's all those cases that we'll never know because there's all those times when as Chevron or as Philip Morris, I'll go to a government and say, we're gonna sue you. And the government, when they'll go to the legal, assist, legal uh, you know, advices, they'll tell, well, oh, this is gonna cost you a lot of money. And this is true, this has happened. In Togo, there was a law about smoking, and actually the Ministry of Health actually did a U-turn when they received a threat from Philip Morris, because the amounts to protect themselves were too high. And it's not just about developing countries. Um, here you have an article from Le Monde, well, um, it's in French, but you have an extract here. Ah, it's in French, anyway. It's, um, there was a law in France, uh, what, we was, what was called the Hulot law, where we wanted to phase out fossil fuels. So after 2020, there shouldn't have been any more fossil fuel extraction on French territory. Nicolas Hulot shows this law in August. It was then sent to the Council of State, Conseil d'État, and then it would have come to the, Europe, uh, the, sorry, the French Parliament. In the Council of State, there's a Canadian company that sends a letter to the Council of State. This is the letter you, that you see here. And in this letter, it's clearly written, we, you have an obligation under the Energy Charter Treaty. If this law comes, you will, you will be against, you will breach your obligation under that treaty. In other terms, it's an ISDS threat. How much did it change the law, we don't know, but we know that the Council of State did advise the government to actually reduce, change the law in order not to have a deadline on 2020. So those are threats that you can see at, at different, um, in different places of the world. Okay. Okay, so yeah, now the critics and what, what has there been so much public opposition against those mechanisms? Well, clearly you see that it gives a lot of right to foreign investors. And it does also um, question things even in the EU, like when you have CETA, it's, the, it's the, um, the treaty between Canada and the European Union. It's being ratified in different countries now. It gives Canadian the right to sue France, for instance, either in national courts or in the international investment regime. But as a German investor in France, you don't get those rights. So why do you give certain foreign investors more rights than other investors in your own country? Also, you give them the right to choose because they get to choose the national courts or the international courts. We should be all equal in front of the law. So it does ask the questions about 
it kind of breaks the equality that we all in front of the law. Also, you get compensation for laws that include climate change laws, that could include environmental law or health law. So, in a way, in this like public interest legislation that gets sued for private interest and that they decided and judged about by people that have a certain trade and investment um, lens. So when you enact an environmental law, you take different opinions into account and you finally do an environmental law. But when you're a trade and investment lawyer and you look at environmental law, you only look for the lens of trade and investment because you only look at how much it respected a trade and investment treaty. And clearly we've seen that it has been used as a threat, so it has an impact on the ability for states to regulate. And again, in terms of independence and fairness, there's really questions. Um, I'm not the only one, it's not only the, uh, the greenies of the environmental organizations that have questions about the system. You see here an arbitrator that he himself questions the system and wonder how so individuals have been given with so much power to review laws. You also have a UN expert on the promotion of democratic and equitable international order. He has been writing a lot about human rights. And to him, he doesn't understand why you can put those company rights and investment rights above any other rights, which includes human rights. Because when you have um, a tribunal, in these treaties, actually, they take precedence over anything else, like even uh, above the Paris Agreement. There's no, where, there's no what we call carve out in, in legal terms. And the costs are very high. So in the case of Mequadar, it's 1.1 billion um, in the case of Chevron. In this case here in Libya, um, so this is a um, United Arab Emirates company that wanted to build a tourist resort in Libya. They had invested 35 million into looking at the land and starting to plan. And then the Libyan war started, so they sued Libya. And what they got is 935 million, which is the amount of money they were expected to win out of this project. In this case here, Poland. Poland had to pay this amount of euros, and it's the equivalent of 200,000 Polish nurses' salaries for in a, a Dutch investment company that had invested in, that were expected to invest in the social security system of Poland. And then the decision changed but still Poland had to pay. This is again research by Gus von Harten, the link that I sent um, to your teacher, so you must have seen it. This is, he's, he is looking to the amount of money, and what we see is this money, this compensation, often goes to the richest individuals and the biggest multinationals, which makes sense, because if you look at the amount, it's the money you need in order to sue a country, it's so high that you would have to be a rich individual or a big company in order to be able to access the system. Um, so the opposition came from civil society when the EU was dealing with the United States or with Canada. They were negotiating and they wanted to include those mechanisms in the treaties. It also came from someone called Magnet in Belgium from Wallonia. I don't know if any of you remember this. So CETA was going to get signed between Trudeau and the European Union. It was the agreement between it is the agreement between the EU and Canada, and then there's something that the Commission didn't think about is it, it, it didn't really listen to Wallonia. So Magnet was the president of Wallonia. It's one of the three regions in Belgium is the southern one, the one when they speak French. Magnet happens to be a U.S. Uh, law professor. He's very good in U.S. law, so he knows really well what ISES is, and he was also the president of Wallonia. He's been doing lots of hearing in his parliament, and he took away the right for Belgium to sign CETA. One year before Belgium was to sign CETA. And then at the moment when Trudeau was about to arrive, then Belgium didn't really solve this problem, and Belgium had to say, hey, we can't sign because we're not allowed, because Wallonia doesn't let us. And it did the whole drama, the whole saga, we heard quite a lot about it. And his main point was this uh, investment tribunals, because he thought that this was giving too much power to companies that were already well protected in the European Union. And one of the things that finally happened, one of the reasons why the whole crisis got solved, was he sent to the European Court of Justice a question whether this was actually legal. Whether it was legal for foreign investors, Canadian investors, to be able to sue states in different judicial systems. 
And this we will know. It was sent more than a year ago, and we will know this in three to four months, whether the European Court of Justice thinks that those system is legal or not. Okay. I want to give I want to give you a short extract, because also because of the story of South Africa. I think it's important to see what happened in this country because. South Africa actually entered the system after apartheid, and then they left and they created something different. Um, they have a very good investment expert in their government that actually uh, explain what happened, so I'm going to show you a short extract now. You had a few problems and decided to take the bull by the horns and find a way to deal with it that is very peculiar. Can you please uh, describe it? Yes, uh, thank Maybe you. Maybe give a little bit of historical perspective. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, I think sitting here and, and listening to the debate that we've been having this morning is kind of uh, a bit of a deja vu, because I think our story really starts when uh, we become a, an independent nation when Nelson Mandela is released. And so at this point, um, there is this contention, but new government, new rules, and uh, foreign investors feel that they, their interests may be um, compromised. And at this point, the government is faced with a dilemma. What do we do to reassure investors that their rights are to be protected? Well, um, we've heard of these bilateral investment treaties. Um, let's have a look at them. Let's sign them. And of course, at that point, the issue was to reassure the international community that we were able to play ball. We were able to protect investors that were in the market. However, um, against this context, we also have a very sad history of racial discrimination. And as a result, a very robust constitution placed many obligations on the state to reverse this, including identifying those parts of the population who had been disregarded and actively implementing a legislative program to protect their interests. And this has come out in so-called black economic empowerment uh, programs, affirmative action programs, for instance. And so against this backdrop, when we start doing this, um, well, we find out that investors are unhappy because, firstly, they never expected that these rules would apply to them. And secondly, um, they feel that it's unfair for them to contribute to the redistribution of wealth in the country. And so, as a result, uh, we've had a few cases, one which we've lost, another which went the other way. But fundamentally, uh, what this has resulted in for us is that we have an obligation to regulate in the public interest and um, we felt that bilateral investment treaties uh, were inhibiting uh, that particular constitutional obligation. I could put it for hours, but I only have 13 minutes left. <laughs> Okay, and also, I want to show you, you've got the link, anyway, um, there's also a lot of academics that also start also questioning what what this system is all about. So, obviously, so many people were angry from different perspectives. Uh, you also have, like, SMEs in Belgium that were not happy about it, so it was not just the, the people that were never happy, it was a lot of people. So the Commission actually rethought its investment policy and it came up with a new name, it's called Investment Court System now. We believe that it's not changed much, but uh, I'm going to try to argue why, but let me explain what happened. Um, so now from now on, from the treaty with Canada, and the future tre treaties that are coming, so the one with Singapore, the one with Vietnam, and the other treaties that are being negotiated, the European Union has what it calls the investment, state, uh, the investment court system. The judge... The arbitrators now are not chosen by the investor and the state, it's chosen out of a pool of arbitrators that are chosen by the states. So there's 15 of them that are paid to be available as arbitrators, 
and when they are arbitrators, they get more money. There's a code of ethic that is uh, stronger, and there's an appeal mechanism. That's the changes that you have, basically. Um, I've put it here in that table. I'm not sure if you see that well, actually. Um, before you had uh, a fee per case, now you have a fee for being available, and you have more money when you have a case, so you still have that bias where the more cases there is, the more money you earn, so you, the more you influence influence into signing with the investor. You have an appeal mechanism, and you still have a stronger ethic rules. But that's most of the changes, basically. Um, if you look at what the judges say in Germany, for instance, they have an association of judges and prosecutors, and when they look at this, they say, well, actually, it still doesn't guarantee the independence of the court, and it's still arbitration. You don't actually have judges. Because the big difference here is, as a judge, whenever you decide you have a job tomorrow, and it's the same one and it's the same amount of money, as an arbitrator, whatever you decide has an impact on how much cases you will have tomorrow. And this is still this is still in the treaties that we have now. Um, ah, there's a slide that has been missing where you actually have a quote from the arbitration industry itself, which says this has not changed because the standards upon which it's based are still the same. So the procedures have been modified, but the rights are still the same, so it hasn't changed that much. Sorry, the science is gone, I don't know what happened. And you still have that system when you give investors more rights than anyone else without any obligation. You still get, there's no carve out, so they still can fight measures for the public interest. You still have a lot of compensation, there's no cap on the amount of money that an investor can receive. You still have a system that is being expanded because the EU is still negotiating with more and more countries. And you still have a lot of transfer of power to uh, foreign investors. Um, at the European level, as I was telling you, um, there's a European Court of Justice that has, is looking into whether this new system is legal. But the European Court of Justice has also looked at all the system inside the European Union. So when a French investor can sue Hungary, or when Vattenfall can sue Germany, this has all been looked upon as well by the European Court of Justice. And the European Court of Justice decided that this is not legal, that, you should, that the investors are well protected in the European Union, they have a European Union law and that's enough. So all the system inside the European Union, now member states have to abolish them. So this would be this year. It's the the member states have to take them away little by little. So I'm thinking of treaties between the Netherlands and Spain, or between Poland and Germany. Or those should be taken away. Intra what we call intra EU bits. This has to be away. We're still waiting to know whether this new system, the one that is CETA, is legal or not, according to the European Court of Justice. But the European Union is still negotiating. And in three, you know, the 12th of February, in the European Parliament, there will be a vote on EU-Singapore investment deal. So there will be a treaty between EU and Singapore just on investment. It's the same one as the one that you have in CETA. It will be voted, and we won't know whether this is legal, so it might have to be changed again according to what the European Court of Justice will say. This new system, the investment court system, the European Union is also trying to push it at the international level in New Central. It has what it calls the multilateral investment court, where it's basically trying to push for the system to become global and international and be signed by the most countries possible. And here it's interesting because here you have really free camp. You have the US and Japan that don't want to change anything to the system. So the US, for instance, has kept it with Mexico for oil, gas, um, telecommunications, and another sector which I will remember. So it has kept it as it is, ISDS, with Mexico in certain sectors. It's, it has taken away with Canada. But at the international level, it doesn't want to change anything. Japan neither doesn't want to change anything. Then you have the European Union with its modified system, the one I showed you before. And then you have countries like South Africa, but also like India, or like Indonesia, that have a very different approach. South Africa, for instance, wants investors to go to national courts prove that they have been discriminated and then be given uh, an international regime. This is the same as India. Uh, Brazil, for instance, has never had any uh, investor-state dispute settlement until now, but we don't know what's going to happen now. 
And <coughs> Indonesia has something which is very interesting in the history of developing countries in the invest international investment regime, is it's actually doing what they call consent. Meaning that before a country can sue other Indonesia, Indonesia will have to agree to arbitration. So it can actually decide not to go to arbitration because it thinks the claim is not right or whatever, for whatever reason. And this is when you were talking about exit, this was one of the main bone of contention with exit. Developing countries didn't want to give automatic consent that, that the investor could go to arbitration without them as actually saying yes or no. And Indonesia wants to go back to this. So that's the different positions that you have at the international system. The, the court is being discussed uh, at the UN, and there are two sessions a year, and the discussions are ongoing. Um, questions that I think were goes around my presentation and you might have that we can discuss later on is, what should be the rights and responsibilities of companies that have operations around the world, and who should define them? Who should pay for the risks that investors take when they go to a country that might be unstable? Do you re does the ISDS really bring investment? When we think of South Africa, for instance, it doesn't have it, it receives investment. Same for Brazil. And can you have public decisions decided and contested in private courts? Thank you very much. And if you want to know more, there's a really cool after documentary and it is in Thanks. Okay, so thank you very much for this interesting uh, presentation. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of the things that we prepared uh, were already said by you, <laughs> but we will still try to add something to it. Um, yeah, maybe you asked yourself during this presentation, why do national states even have an interest in uh, agreeing to ISDS? Um, and I try to respond to that by saying that um, FDIs are often considered a very important development factor, especially in developing countries. So the UN Conference of Tra uh, on Trade and Development in 2014, they stated that global investment needs to reach five to seven trillion dollars uh, a year to reach the sustainable development goals. So that means that um, attracting FDI became a priority in a lot of countries, especially developing ones. Um, and one way to do so uh, are, in fact, the investor state dispute settlements, so the protection of investors, uh, which allow foreign investors to sue host governments uh, at international arbitral tribunals, as our guest lecturer already said. Um, this means that private firms can claim for compensation if a state implements policies um, that make them lose potential future profits, um, which was already said as well. For example, if they implement policies like augmentation of minimum wage or uh, stricter laws on environmental uh, or health issues. And investor protection is part of more than 3,000 um, uh, international investment agreements. Some of them are bilateral and some of them are part of international agreements such as NAFTA, RCEP or TTIP. And um, as you might know, the main objectives of these national, uh, international investment agreements are to promote investment flows, to depoliticize disputes, disputes between investors and states, uh, to promote the rule of law, and to provide compensation for certain harms to investors. Yeah, at the same time, uh, international investment agreements are highly criticized among others for their ISDS uh, rulings, because FDI attraction often causes a race to the bottom, which means that countries try more and more to lower taxes, to lower labor standards, to attract uh, as many FDIs as possible. And also there is no clear evidence um, that, the, that there is an effect of correlation between the investment agreements and FDI flows as for example Brazil shows. Uh, Brazil doesn't have any uh, ISDS agreements but still has one of the highest FDI inflows. Or um, also the case of the US and China uh, which also do FDI but they don't really have an agreement with each other. And um, another criticism 
on the ISDS is uh, the benefits that are often reduced to taxes and uh, royalties because firms import their own goods and services. So they don't necessarily create jobs in the host countries. Uh, also, ISDS substitute uh, domestic legal institutions and uh, especially in underdeveloped uh, legal systems, they further weaken these systems. Yeah, and finally, ISDS um, have an impact on policy making and environmental and social factors. So um, they don't respond to public interests, but maybe, may, uh, mainly to private ones. Um, they lead to a regulatory chill, which means that countries might delay certain policy um, implementations and reforms, simply because they're afraid of ISDS uh, consequences. This is uh, very often related to sustainability measures. And uh, some of the biggest claimers are the tobacco and fossil industries. They even sometimes collaborate with each other and they use ISDS to delay policy implementations, which are uh, related to health and environment. For example, uh, the tobacco industry often uses uh, ICS when a country tries to change uh, cigarette packaging or health laws or fossil, the fossil in industry, they use ICS if a country tries to use, reduce the fossil energy. And it is quite logic that these uh, firms try to use this uh, ICS because they have a fear of becoming obsolete within these countries. Yeah, so to sum up, we can say that ICS are often delaying measures on climate change, but also impacting social factors. They cause a relocation of population and also create a certain dependency on jobs. Yeah, now my colleague Luisa will go on. Um, thank you. Um, since everything I wanted to tell you was also been said already, um, I will just provide some supplementary details, which I found interesting during my research on the topic. So, um, on the Ecuador case study, which has um, been mentioned already, um, where Chevron um, sued Ecuador on an um, international uh, court, um, ICS, um, the very recent uh, uh, claim the tribunal, the international tribunal made, so they, they ruled in favor of Chevron in 2018. This is a very um, recent decision, I think from November, if I'm not wrong. Um, and they claimed that there has been a settlement between Texaco and Ecuador before. So that would have um, prevented Texaco from any liabilities uh, regarding um, ecological damage in Ecuador. They claimed that Chevron never actually held any assets in Ecuador because they bought Texaco when they had already left Ecuador. And they also claimed that the Ecuadorian um, $9.5 billion sentence from 2011, which came from an Ecuadorian court, was based on fraud, bribery, and corruption. And for these reasons, um, they started a trial for compensation for Chevron damages. So we can see in the Ecuadorian uh, case that even after 25 years, the case is not settled and um, these uh, trials can take a long time and therefore delay um, uh, certain policies because um, states fear of exactly these, these effects. And some other details about who the people are on the arbitrary tribunals. We already heard that this is a hugely profitable business. Um, there's a lot of money involved and the network which is um, behind um, these uh, tribunals is uh, very strong and close. Um, to remind you that there is no special qualifications or um, appointment by courts required. Um, so we see here that 96% uh, of all um, lawyers employed on the arbitrary tribunals are men, and they are mostly from European and North American law offices. The majority of them are from 20 US offices, actually. And uh, we already heard about the amount of money that was um, paid in total in the Ecuador Chevron case, but to point out one specific individual, the president, um, who was a German lawyer in the 2011 tribunal, earned just for this one um, 700,000 euros. 
some other background details on other important arbitrators. One of them, the third one on my slides, we have heard already, um, but others are also among the top 15 arbitrators um, employed. They all had held around 30 cases. Um, <coughs> one of them is Francisco Orega Orego V. Cunha from Chile. He is usually president of the tribunal if he is employed, so the uh, together agreed upon uh, arbitrator. Um, he held several government positions during the Pinochet dictatorship. Um, Marc Lalonde, another Canadian um, lawyer and ex-minister, he has strong ties to, um, to the government, was also board member of Citibank Canada and Air France. And the, the one we already heard, um, Yves Fortier, uh, is also board member of Nova Chemicals, Alcan and Rio Tinto. And just to remind you that Rio Tinto is not even anymore on the portfolio of the Norwegian oil fund due to ecological considerations. Um, so the background is strongly uh, connected to um, large businesses, especially in the uh, mining oil and, and energy industries. Um, Gabriel Kaufmann-Kohle, a Swiss um, lawyer, one of the 4% women, um, defended Vivendi and EDF against Argentina when Argentina, uh, when a lot of investors uh, claimed uh, damages for uh, reparations from Argentina after their um, severe financial uh, economic crisis. Um, and two years later, she became board member of UBS, the Swiss bank, which was the single largest shareholder of, um, in Vivendi. So we can see that, see that the independence is questionable and yeah, this is, as we already heard, the main criticism of the setup of these ideas. Yeah, so it all sounds very privative and not very in favor of the public. That's why there are also strong social movements against the international trade agreements and I'm sure that you've heard of some of them. Here on the pictures we see um, one, the one that says coal kills, that's, a vet, uh, that's on the case of Vattenfall. Then we see the stop CETA, stop TTIP and CETA and stop uh, TPP. Yeah, most of the movements come from Europe and uh, they especially critique, um, when they critique these agreements, they say that they are mainly beneficial for big corporations, that little overall economic improvements are made, and uh, that they actually disempower politics, and they might also lower labor standards due to uh, competition coming from uh, the other states. They, that they also weaken European consumer rights and food safety standards, that they also might increase unemployment and uh, env environmental damage, and finally, that the ISDS undermine the power of national governments to act in the interest of their citizens. And these social movements uh, are slowly, slowly also showing some effect. As we see, for example, in, in the TTIP, um, France and Germany, uh, besides some other environmentalists uh, and labor unionists, uh, they pled for the removal of the ISDS and in, in September 2015 uh, the ISDS are finally abandoned and the uh, European Commission proposes the investment court system that was already mentioned by uh, Laura. And yeah, finally it was Trump to halt the, the agreement, so yeah, the future of this agreement is unclear because Current negotiations are classified. Yeah, the other one, the CETA, was already mentioned, so I'm not going to go into detail on that. And then there is also the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which um, was signed in 2016 and made, made it slightly stricter for companies uh, to sue nation states. Um, in this case, ISDS required new specific treaty violations and they don't allow corporations to sue solely over lost profit. So this agreement specifically also excludes the tobacco industry because yeah, they are concerned about cases such as Philip Morris and Uruguay. And that's why I said we don't give ISDS to the tobacco industry anymore. And also in this case, it was Trump to finally uh, interrupt the deal 
and uh, the remaining countries made a new deal, which is called CPTPP. And uh, yeah, the NAFTA was also already mentioned, which is now NAFTA 2.0, because it was uh, one of the big promises of Trump in the, in the election campaign. He said that he wants to renegotiate uh, the NAFTA or even abolish it. And so there was also differences made uh, concerning the ISDS, uh, which I think was also already mentioned. Yeah, and then I want to close with a quote from The Economist, which says that if you want to convince the public uh, that international trade agreements are a way to let multinational companies get rich at the expense of ordinary people, this is what you would do. Give foreign firms a special right to apply to a secretive tribunal of highly paid corporate lawyers for compensation whenever a government passes a law. Two, say, discourage smoking, protect the environment, or prevent a nuclear catastrophe. Yet, that is precisely what thousands of trade and investment treaties over the past half century have done, through a process known as Investor State Dispute Settlements, or ISDS. With that, I want to close, and uh, we also still have some questions for you. My first question to you is, um, without ISDS, would the progress on environment policies with, uh, within nation states be acceler accelerated significantly, or would it only have a minor impact? The second question is, does the tendency of the US towards protectionism, as we saw with Trump, uh, and nationalism, constitute a new trend in international investment relations? And two questions from, from my side. The one is actually one to an insider, so I hope you can give me a bit of insight. Um, because during the discussions regarding TTIP, um, I was in contact with some, some lobbyists and activists for and against um, TTIP. And there, uh, it came to my knowledge that uh, in the US, it is actually argued that it is the EU who insists on inclusion of these ISDS in the, in the, in the in free trade agreement. And in the EU, it was the other way around, such that it was argued that the US is the one who insists on uh, inclusion of the, of the ISDS. So uh, certainly it's not the US or the EU, but um, I wonder what your um, perception is of who has the upper hand in this, in this respect. And an open question, not only to you, but to, to all of us. Um, if we are not happy with the um, setup of ISDS and the system as it is now, what else um, do we suggest as an alternative, um, an alternative protection mechanism for international investment, <coughs> since we cannot um, neglect the fact that there is the case of um, corrupt governments and um, expropriation and um, unfair treatment of foreign investment, investors and it is crucial to um, find a strategy how to, how to deal with this, this problem. And with this I want to invite everyone uh, to participate in the discussion and if you want to comment on anything that came to your mind during our brief presentation you're welcome um, to share it with us. Thank you. Oh, and I will. Okay, no, please go if you want to. Should I answer and then, or you want to go? I think, yeah, uh, yeah. if you answer something, it then be open up. Okay. Thank you. Great, Great. very good question, thanks. Um, without the ISDS, would we have had more environmental uh, legislation? It's, it's hard to know. Um, here there's a quote by Leibnizer, the US trade representative, who actually said that um, there was bipartisan legislation in the US that never came to light because of ISDS, meaning bipartisan, meaning both Democratic and Republicans agreed to it, but they didn't go forward because um, of ISDS. So some environmental, organization, environmental legislation probably has been stopped with the threat, but it's very hard to know, so without any research, I wouldn't be able to answer. <coughs> In the US, it seems on trade that Trump only understands trade when he goes between two people. I think it's something where he wants to be the stronger in a bilateral relationship, which probably exp um, explains TTIP or TPP. 
Um, he's not really protectionist and nationalist because when we see uh, NAFTA 2.0, he has kept ISDS for government contracts of US company with the Mexican government in certain sectors. So in a way, he's. I think if he had to do a deal with the developing countries, he probably kept it. So it's, um, yeah, it's, but there's clearly a nationalist thing. When Leibniz talks about ISDS, this first thing is always about sovereignty. I, I haven't talked much about sovereignty in my presentation, but from the right and the far right, we always hear this, something about sovereignty. You know, we want to have the right to regulate as we want, and no one else should tell us what we should do. This is something Poland uses a lot in Europe, where they don't want someone non-Polish to have an imputation on Polish laws. This is a fact. And, but it's, it's, it was really not the kinds of arguments that I wanted to put forward. Um, the EU has clearly pushed for ISDS in TTIP, mostly from the banking sector, from France and uh, Germany, because the BNP had a fine in the US, and they felt they were discriminated. And they found that the judicial system in the US always favored US banks versus EU banks. So the, the, um, that maybe today the car sector would be happy to have ISDS against the US. So there was clearly a push by the um, private sector in the EU for, for, for ISDS in TTIP. As an alternative, um, I mean, I would always favor for countries to actually, because one of the the problem with this is exactly what you said, if you have a parallel system, if you just your system is not working and you create a parallel one, you actually even get the one that's there is even weaker. So an idea would be exhaustion of local remedies, so what we say in, in legal terms, meaning you go through the national courts and if you really have a problem, then there could be an appeal mechanism at the international level and make it as public as possible, being with judges that are paid a fixed salary from the beginning to the end and with judges that are not just trading investment lawyers, that have to take quite a consideration of other things. And with what we call carve-outs in the legal terms, meaning you can't sue for a social policy, you can't sue for climate change legislation, for you can't sue for environmental legislation. And this is things, in the TPP you have a tobacco carve-out, you take away tobacco policy, well, why don't we have it for climate change, for social welfare? You can take a look. So if you, had, if you reduce the reach of the treaty itself and excludes climate change legislation, social legislation. And then in the procedure, if you first go to national courts and then have an appeal at the international level, I think you would reduce all the unfairness that we've seen until now. Thank you very much. Um, now I invite you to, to uh, pose your questions and to participate. And I'm happy to see three things that happen. You go from you have to right to left. The microphone, I guess. Sorry? You have to the no, microphone. we don't have to. If you speak loud enough, apparently this is captured by the. So okay. Okay. okay, let's start with Isabel, Yannick, and Martin. Uh, I <coughs> just wanted to uh, uh, get a little more on the on insight from, par uh, from you. Uh, about how is the process of uh, s uh, settling this arbitrage uh, committee? Because uh, it seems to me that also there's a political uh, uh, issue that is you have to motivate the case to to uh, be able to put it in a different court, a different stages. For example, in the in the Chevron Texaco, it was it initiated as a, a civil demand for civil claim from the from the people and then it cl climbed it like in this system uh, so yeah so if you can explain it a little bit more how do you arrive to this arbitrage and how do you uh, yeah classify this as investment uh, settlement case and uh, also if you could say a, a little bit more uh, if you would agree that, uh, for example, these developing countries that are kind of, it's more difficult uh, to, at, at a certain extent, to uh, motivate these cases would be treated uh, with some kind of preferences or, or it maybe this would be wrong. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Um, yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Yannick. Uh, uh, I'm from Germany and I'm uh, studying the development track in this program. So, um, to my knowledge, uh, if there are international cases between states at the International Court of Justice, um, then it's based on the UN Charter. So, uh, my question is, uh, like, uh, what legal basis um, well, yeah, is able to set, wait out um, the, the national public interest and the sovereignty of the state. So what is the legal basis of these ISDS? And uh, actually, like, who is making these laws? Um, yeah, so, so who is the, the originator uh, for the decision making, basically? Okay. Um, first, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation on a very important topic. I'm Martin, I'm from Belgium, and I also study in option C, development option. Uh, I have three questions, actually. I'm sorry <laughs> about that. Um, so first, you showed figures about Latin America, where you mentioned that, it was mentioned that 70% um, of cases were won by private investors, not by states. I wonder if you have an idea of these figures on the global scale. Then I also wonder, um, usually in... Um, um, court uh, cases, sorry, um, when a party loses the case, it must pay for the, um, the fees of the, the opponent party. I wonder if this is also true here. And finally, my last question is, is, is uh, a bit linked with that of Yannick. Um, so I, I think that in what you said, you imply that uh, these cases are uh, played at uh, the International Court of Justice, but it's, it's not really the case. It's a special uh, facility that was um, made especially for that. And But I also wonder, so how come that, um, so before Captain Magnet made his show and before we had um, uh, this case with Slovakia in, um, in the EU in 2018, how come there were not uh, prior attempts at trying to use superior legal principles or legal obligations from the state in order to play uh, outside the box of these uh, ISDS mechanisms. Um, yeah, and if, if there were, um, uh, how, yeah, which, what were these cases? And if not, how come it, we had to wait so long? Okay. Okay. I was just a bit confused with the governance structure of this um, arbitration tribunals. Um, yeah, he said the international court system. I, it's just not very clear to me. It's each bilateral agreement choosing a different institution who will arbitrage this or not. Like, if we can just. The, um, don't forget to produce yourself. Okay, sorry. My name is Louise. I'm from Brazil, from Option C, also development policy. Thank you. <laughs> and the, the, the arbitrators, they're usually free. And what happens is um, uh, I would be chosen by a state, she would be chosen by an investor, and the third one, we either agree between the state and the uh, investor, or if we don't agree, it's the institutions where we have the case that decide. So in ICSID or in the International uh, Chamber of Commerce, or there it's the, the place where the case happens that decides on the third person if us two haven't been able to decide. Um, just, so that's what, how we decide the free arbitrators. Well, if to decide who it is, the, the thing is, it's funny because I had this discussion with um, the prosecutor, the general prosecutor of Ecuador, and she was saying, the problem is, as in the state, you have to choose the best arbitrators and the best lawyers because if you don't pay for the best one, you know you're going to be losing. So there's a, the reason why there's such this elite club is also because of this, because the state has, you know, it has to take part of this big club of people too. So that's why you also keep having the same people all the time. Um, in Ecuador, there were parallel uh, courts. So there was a civil, play, a civil in Ecuador, there was civil in the US, there was one in Argentina. 
And in the case of Vattenfall, it's the same thing. Vattenfall also, for the nuclear phase out, also went to the national courts in Germany and lost. But it's allowed to do both. It can, things can happen on the national level and it can still go to investment at the same time, before, after, or during. It's whenever the investor feels that his rights were not respected and it can sue. So whether or not something's happening at the national level doesn't have an impact. Whether it's criminal or penal or whatever, it doesn't have an impact. So it's really at the moment when it feels his rights are not respected. So there's no procedure with this. Um, in developing countries, whether in developing countries there is a bias in the judicial system, that's kind of what you were telling me. There, there, I mean, obviously in some countries there is, there is also corruption, there's no, I'm, I'm not going to deny this. Um, but in a way, whoever goes to a country has to accept the way it works, that's how the legal system works. So. That's why I was saying you can go to a country, prove there was discrimination or corruption, and then have an appeal mechanism at the international level where you would have judges not from this country that can have a, a different opinion and it can help the investor if there has been corruption. But if you, you know, if you don't, if you sidetrack the judicial system, there's there's no incentive for the country to make it better. And um, so the legal basis. Um, there's been conventions that have been signed between countries in order for the system to work. One of the biggest one is the ICSID convention, the one in the World Bank that was signed uh, in, after the Second World War. And it's a convention between states, where states um, create the means for the systems to work. So it really came from the state. Um, the originator has been ICSID, and it was what I was telling you about, there was this fight between the US General Secretary of ICSID, the first one was from the US, and the developing countries didn't want to have consent, automatic consent. There was a fight and finally he managed to put automatic consent in the ICSID convention. So the countries signed to be automatically subject to this system, which means that whenever they receive a complaint, they start being sued, they have to just follow the rules that they have signed, which includes a means to receive the money. Argentina was sued during the financial crisis where it was very unstable and didn't have means to pay for the fees. Argentina didn't pay for a while and so the investor went to the US court system to get all the money that Argentina as a country had in the US, which meant that some flights from um, Aerolinas Argentinas couldn't um, to take off anymore. They, the, the, the planes themselves were grounded and, and put aside until Argentina was going to pay for the fee. So there's a whole system signed by the state of the procedures and then how to get the money after this. And this is what led to the court that I told you about, the ACMIA. Slovakia was made to pay a lot of money because um, Slovakia had a private um, social system, health system. It was private by 31% and it was ACMIA that had this system in Slovakia. The system was not working and the socialist government campaigned saying we're going to renationalize because it's not working. They won the election and they went to ACMIA and said we can give you the money for paying back those 31%. ACMIA refused and said no, we're not taking it back and Slovakia did take it back and ACMIA did an ISDS against Slovakia and in this ISDS Slovakia had to pay for future lost profit, meaning not just pay the 31% that it paid back to ACMIA, but all the money that ACMIA would have done with those 31%. Obviously, Slovakia didn't want to pay, so ACMIA went to the German courts to get money from Slovakia. And that's where the German courts thought, mm, really? Is this really legal? And then they asked the European Court of Justice. Before that, there was not that much controversial cases, and there was not that much knowledge about this as well. Because what you need to think is, in order for me to know what happens in the uh, investment regime, I have to pay the EEA reporter, which is more than 3,000 euros per year, where there's one journalist that tells me about the cases, because otherwise I don't have access to the information. When I go to ICSID, I don't find the materials of the cases. Not all the cases are public. The people that teach usually about investment arbitration in universities, they have, usually are 
close to the arbitration industry, so they give you a certain way of seeing things. So there's very little critical expertise on international arbitration. It's much better now than it was 10 or 20 years ago, which explains why before that there was not really any questioning about this. So that's why it's well, that's why we've had to wait until now, really, before we got a debate about the, those things. You asked me about Latin America. In if you looked at the UNCTAD, they have a, um, they've looked at the cases that are public and the international level, and it's about one third that are cited by the investor, one third by the state, and one third that are settled. Settled being there's a private agreement between the company and the state, but this you, you don't know what it has inside. When the party loses, sometimes it has to pay for the fees of the opponent party. Sometimes it doesn't have to. It's for the tribunal to judge. When the party wins, it doesn't always get its money back. So in Philip Morris against Australia, Australia didn't lose, but it didn't got its legal fees paid back. And whilst there was a case in Australia on smoking, New Zealand didn't do anything on tobacco, which, which was really the idea behind Philip Morris sued Uruguay because Argentina and Brazil wanted to have an anti-smoking legislation. It was not just to get money out of Uruguay. Sorry, just so the, the figures you said one third, one third, one third. Oh, I, I can look it up now. This, you but you you repeated that this was about Latin America. No, this is international. You asked me about international. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, maybe I'll look at it later. Oh, I can show you. Like, I can show you at the end if you want to fix. Um, so you have a, a treaty between uh, uh, Brazil. Yeah, no, Brazil doesn't have VIT, so no. <laughs> yeah, Switzerland and Uruguay, and um, the tribunal is actually decided by the, the investor that can sue. So they can say, I'm going to go to ICSID or I'm going to go to ICC. Or they decide on the institution where the procedure will happen to interpret the BIT. Is that clear? Yeah? I think I will. Um, I would just briefly like to say something to uh, Isabel's question, even though I'm not perfectly sure if I understood you right. Uh, but I wanted to uh, remind you that um, the population damaged uh, in the Ecuadorian case, they, they did not use the international um, tribunal system because they cannot. A state or the uh, like damaged population had no way of using the international um, arbitrary uh, tribunal to, to, to claim for something. They, only have to, they can only go to domestic courts. So yeah. Just as a yeah. Actually, what I was saying is uh, to motivate it as an international case, it has to climb a certain, certain uh, or it has to be put in different courts. This is what I see from the Chevron case because it was it initiated back in a civil court. It was it was a national court. Then, as you said, it was in a uh, U.S. court. And then, when it became big politically, it became uh, diffused. And then it was an investment settle settlement case. So this is what I was uh, trying to address, if, if this political um, issue that also, because in order to make a case, you have to be, be heard. So this is what I was trying to understand a little bit more how the process works. Because uh, also, for example, there's another case in Ecuador that is the Occidental versus Ecuador case that is mostly uh, not not very well known as in the Chevron case, uh, but it's uh, that's why I wanted to say what when do we call it uh, investment settlement? But and now I understand this. It's there's several processes that I just want to address this political also point. Okay, then Michelle, I have on the list uh, Niels and Sophie. And Luis again. <laughs> okay, Michelle, please. Okay, so my name is Michelle. I'm also from Brazil, from option A, which is knowledge. And uh, I don't know if you heard there is a there was a case, a tragedy that happens two days or three days ago in Brazil, which there are like three hundred people missing and over six sixty people died 
on a tragedy on a uh, them. Yeah, them. Uh, uh, them. Yeah. <laughs> on a minor or so uh, my question is I know that Brazil is not under this uh, international court but I'm pretty sure that we could claim that uh, this they were uh, under the legislation they were not that's what they could claim we, we are not sure yet but uh, the thing is what could be the way to solve these issues between the multinational co corporations interests against like interests uh, against uh, citizens uh, or even human rights but uh, if there are other discussions in other levels I guess you already spoke a little bit that takes this into consideration like for instance the United Nations or something Neil? Um. <coughs> um, Niels, I'm from Option C, also development, and I'm French. And my question would be about uh, your giving potential directions to uh, better, in, in a way, the ISDS system uh, internationally. And I'm wondering actually what political channels <coughs> are actually available for this, because it, it seems that like the, the very point of like making long-term treaties with like uh, uh, backlash conditions, which means that like I don't know, like conditions going on for 20 years or something. It seems that the institutions are very uh, stable, and kind of impossible to change in a way. Or and if it is, who can or how? Um, I think my question in sentence follows up Lee's question. Um, I would like to know a bit. Sophie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my name is Sophie, I'm from Germany, I'm from Optimum, I click and I'm final. And I would like to know what exactly has been inquired at the European Court of Justice. Um, is it the general procedure, if that is generally legal? And if that is the case, and supposedly the European Court of Justice would judge it illegal, what would, what, what would it change? Because you said, in a certain sense, it doesn't matter what happens at the national level. Um, the contracts are signed, it's basically an institution we have installed at the international level that is totally intangible by anything. And um, it's not only that, if we, for example, in the case of Vatsenfall in Germany, Germany is um, the subject, but also Germany benefits because its companies can sue developing countries, for example. So it has a way bigger perspective, it has a global perspective instead of just the European perspective. So what would it change if the European Court of Justice would say, no, this is illegal? So from what happened in Brazil, this, um, there are negotiations that have been started by Ecuador mm -hmm. and are now supported by South Africa. At the UN level, it's called the Working Group on Business and Human Rights, and it's actually trying to address exactly what you've been saying, how do we make sure that multinational respect uh, human and environmental rights, and who would judge whether they are respected or not. And um, it's, it's very interesting discussions. There's a zero draft that's just been out by Ecuador, where they, they'll be discussing it in October this year. And the discussions are about this, you know, is it the state that has to make sure that its companies respect? Is it uh, the other state? Who, who will actually decide it? And it divides people even within the human rights community, but it's a very interesting process. It's in the working group session at the moment, so between countries. And there's one country that's from the EU that's supporting is France because it has a similar law. The EU only goes but doesn't speak there because it doesn't have an EU mandate. And there are more and more countries at the EU level that are thinking about adopting a law like France, which is actually the responsibility of French multinational in terms of human rights outside France. I know there are discussions in Germany and in Switzerland, for instance. So by doing this, at the national level, some countries are trying to push this at the international level. It's quite complicated because, for instance, with South Africa, uh, the US would say, oh, South Africa is only doing this to support its, its own companies. Um, so it's, it's and unfortunately, the working group will probably come out with a draft, then it will have to go to the General Assembly, and we know that some countries will probably veto, such as the United States. But still, it's interesting to follow to, to those kinds of discussions and the responsibility and who judges. Um, the political channels for change, I would, I'm a uh, very optimist, I will always tell you there's a way for change, but um, 
What happens at the international level, sorry, UNCTRA, the UN Commission on International Trade and Arbitration Law, is that the EU put on the table its proposal for a new ISDS, the ICS. At the international, they call it the MIG, the Multilateral Investment Court. And so discussion started about how do we change this system. And here it's really to see how developing countries are very happy to have this discussion openly at the international level. And a lot of them, like Indonesia, Aida, wants to go further than just the limited discussions of the EU. So they want to go into the substance and the procedures, where the EU is only about the, the procedure. Um, but that's the UN and that the discussion at the end. And then there's the crude reality of just po international political relations. Um, I sat down with the negotiator of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka was the first ISDS cases where the investment gained so much money that that's when the law firms start looking into this. It's, it's known as the case that really changed and then really start that was the boom of the ISDS. And it's because there was a war in Sri Lanka, a guerrilla, and uh, some of the guerrilla fighters uh, took refuge in a shrimp um, farms in Sri Lanka, owned by a British individual. And so the army bombarded the shrimp factory, and then the British individual started ISDS and got a lot of money. The amount was very, very high, so high that Sri Lanka, because of political pressure, actually terminated um, this uh, bilateral investment deal. But this one. And then when I sit with the Sri Lankan negotiator, I'm like, but you've been sued seven times since this. This was like 15 years ago. You had to pay so much money. Why haven't you stopped the other ones? And he tells me, because when I go to Germany, or when I go to France and I tell them, can we renegotiate this treaty? They go, no, sorry. And that's why the political relation, when Argentina goes to France and say, now we're going to have to renegotiate, the discussion is different. So, unfortunately for some countries, the poorer players in the game, even if they do want to change on the bilateral level, it's very difficult for them. And then there's, there's Ecuador, when, when I see the negotiator of Ecuador, Ecuador maybe is not, as, I want to say Colombia, because Ecuador is a bit more complex. Colombia, she says, yeah, I'm, the min I'm, I'm with you, I'm with the Ministry of Justice in Colombia, we're with you, we know what this means, we know how much it is. But then when I go to the Minister of the Economy or the Minister of Energy and Mining, he tells me there's no way. Because he still believes, or she still believes, that you need this to bring investment. So sometimes there's also very, there's internal conflicts within countries. So that's, that's the reality of the power game. The European Court of Justice um, is looking at the treaty, the investment chapter of CETA. It's looking at whether, actually, it's, the major question is, until now, the European Court of Justice is the last resort for the interpretation of the EU law. They're the final judge. If you have ISDS, you have investment arbitrators that are going to interpret EU law. And they will have the final word. So is this going to break the idea of autonomy of the European Court of Justice, meaning it's the last autonomous power to have to interpret EU law. So that's the, the, the question that is asked to the European Court of Justice. There are also side questions about whether it's compatible with EU law to have some uh, rights for foreign investors. If the European Court of Justice says it's not legal, the, U the European Commission has to change CETA. It has to change the agreement with Vietnam, Singapore, and the ones that it's negotiating at the moment, but they're not final. So it will have to change the treaty. So this will change the procedures later on and probably reduce the number of potential cases. Um, clearly, Germany has lost a lot from those cases, but the German companies have won also. And this is clearly one of the tensions that you have internally. No? And, it's, and it's interesting, because I was speaking with someone from the Commission, and when there was this judgment about the treaties inside the European Union, there were countries that really wanted to stop those treaties. It was Spain and Germany, because they were being sued. Germany was being sued by Swedish companies. Spain is being sued by a lot of Dutch companies and Luxembourg's companies. So they clearly wanted to stop. Sweden didn't want to stop this. And Luxembourg even didn't want to, because their companies were benefiting from it. And that's, I think there's a lot of internal tensions inside states themselves, where some part of the government will see the eyes of the companies and we win from this. And others will be no, we, we lose too much. Okay, let's continue with Louisa, Philip, and Chris. So, you're mentioning some opposition from developing countries like uh, Indonesia. 
Asia and South Africa. But um, as you talked about before, these countries are competing for FDI. So for me, it seems like this individual position um, doesn't really make a lot of sense because then investors could just choose another country that is still protecting um, their rights. So is there any kind of organized opposition from developing countries, um, either in the UN level or also outside the UN? Like, how is this working? Because to me, it seems like it would be more of a strategic way to fight this. Philip? Yeah, my name is Philip. Um, I'm from Germany and studying in option C, also the development option. And uh, my question refers to the Paris Agreement that you also mentioned. And um, I mean, we all know that, uh, yeah, all major multilateral organizations dubbed the low carbon transition or the fight against climate change actually like as a major um, uh, opportunity, investment opportunity, and also for economic growth. But at the same time, to um, uh, yeah, to, to, to reach the ambition, like the, the ambitious goals um, in the Paris Agreement, we all know we need also substantial divestment. And my question is, um, uh, in far, in how far the ISDS um, uh, were actually considered in the Paris Agreements, if there is, if there are some sections, if they have been uh, forgotten, and um, if they maybe in the future will, um, uh, yeah, will, will in inhibit actually the, um, uh, the, the, the process to a more um, decarbonized economy. And Chris? Uh, yeah, well, I'm Chris, also from Germany and also from GNC, which is development. And I wonder a little bit more about the governance of those, um, those, um, yeah, of those settlement regimes. Um, because you said this exit, it's like based at the World Bank, and you said the countries um, do not have the right, or like that the US pushed through that um, the, the countries do not have to agree uh, to go to an ISDS settlement. So I wonder in how far are the countries obliged to be in this exit commission or like in this World Bank? It's like a, I'm just remind, reminded a little bit of those um, structural adjustment programs in the 80s and 90s in Latin America, which made those Latin American countries to uh, agree to liberalization and privatization policies uh, under the um, Washington consensus. So is it a kind of pressure regime here uh, which is used, or how come that Brazil doesn't have it, for example? And just the second question would be, what do you think is going to be the result in the European Court of Justice? I would be really interested in this. <laughs> Thanks for all the questions. Um, in terms of attracting FDI, um, I mean, I've had other discussions with the person that you've seen speaking and with the representatives in, in the UN. Um, South Africa is in the view that ISDS is not one of the key criteria to bring investment. South Africa thinks that companies, when they come to its country, they also look at the infrastructure, the level of education, the security and violence, and things like this are not just about ISDS. So the, the, the amount of FDI has not really been impacted since they've left. And Indonesia has been leaving some treaties and its level of uh, FDI has not been impacted. But it's true that on the international they compete for FDI. They have an organization called the South Center. I think you might have received a paper from the South Center on actually on FDI and uh, ISDS that I circulated. The only issue is the South Center speaks for developing countries and China in those forums, especially in Citroën, and there it is, it, the interests are too different, so the South Center actually doesn't speak anymore, fortunately. But it does a lot of research on behalf of developing countries and, and trying to, to highlight it. There's no mention on, of the international investment regime in the Paris Agreement, and there's no mention of the Paris Agreement in the international investment regime. Um, I think it's two different communities that don't really talk to each other, um, I've been referring a lot to Gus on Harten. He's been drafting a climate carve-out, which will make sure that actually no climate legislation could be pursued. <coughs> but we have not seen any of this climate carve-out until now. And it's clearly an issue when we think of disvestment. And when we also think about the fact that um, ISDS, basically, <coughs> if you have a change in policy, it can be questioned in ISDS, no? with those courts. And with climate change, we're going to need to change a lot of our policies that we're making today. So clearly, it, it, in terms of flexibility and, and the, po the power for the regulators to actually make strong decisions, it really is questioned by ISDS. An example is the Keystone Pipeline. 
there was a lot of resistance to the Keystone Pipeline in the US. It was a pipeline that was going to bring tar sands from Canada. Tar sands are the most polluting form of fossil fuels. You actually press uh, sand in order to take oil. And it was going to go through the US, through the Keystone Pipeline, down to the coast in order to be exported. There was a lot of organizations, a lot of movements against it. Obama dropped the Keystone Pipeline because of the Paris Agreement. He used climate change reasons for this. And TransCanada, which had only built a very small part of the pipeline, actually sued the US. But now the case is dropped because uh, Trump has actually approved the Keystone Pipeline again. And in terms of, um, so the entire story of Ixit is in one of the documents that you that put here. Um, it was a lot of pressure from the US, yeah, clearly to have consent for all the signatures of Ixit to consent to arbitration automatically. And it's that pressure that won, and all the countries that have signed uh, have to consent to arbitration, it's automatic consent. Um, it is in those years as well where it was part of the Washington consensus. It was also part of UNCTAD and a lot of UN entities that were pushing for this as well. They were making uh, a lot of um, trainings to developing countries and telling them this is something that's actually going to help you. Um, Brazil actually negotiated, the, the government negotiated bilateral investment treaties, but the parliament never ratified them, so they never went through the parliament. How is the ECG going to decide on that? It's hard to know how the ECG is going to decide. And this free scenario, either it says it's illegal, it says it needs to be changed to be legal, or it says it's legal. And today, this morning, uh, the reason why I was early is because at 9.30 it was the Advocate General that gave his opinion. So this time is the big chamber of the ECG. It's all the European Court of Justice judges that will have to give an opinion. But the Advocate General, the leader, gave his opinion this morning and he said it's compatible. And then in two or three months, we'll hear from the entire chamber. There's clearly a lot of different opinions inside the ECG, so I would think that it would probably be that they would make some changes and that it would be legal in order for all the sides to be happy. But I know that uh, there's lots of uh, journalists, Le Monde journalist, for instance, is looking into any potential conflict of interest, and unfortunately they are in the European Court of Justice, people that financially benefit from the system. It's a minority, I'm not, but there are so. So I guess maybe it would be a consensus where it would be a yes and no answer, but uh, this is really a guess. In the ACMIA case, the Advocate General said intra-EU bits are legal, and the final decision was they are illegal. So what happens today doesn't mean it will happen in three months. We'll see. I have Jan on the list. Is anybody else? Okay, Hannah, me. Yeah, please start. Um, okay, thank you for your presentation. I'm Jan from Argentina, from option A, that means uh, knowledge and innovation policies. Uh, I will bring back something that has been already mentioned, but on your presentation you mentioned that it, uh, it's a one-way system, and that's something that I found really interesting, and uh, I wanted to ask you if the state has uh, other channels to sue companies uh, at national or international level, but without uh, considering UN, and if the state should be represented. Uh, for example, as the case of Brazil, I, I found some that case really interesting because it seems like a good reason to sue <coughs> the company. Uh, I even considering that this could have a negative impact in the looking forward for FDI in the future, but it also can sell down uh, mm, like rules to FDI in Brazil, like if you are coming, then you can be sued. Uh, so that would be my question. Hannah, please. Hello, my name is Hannah. I'm Austrian and I'm studying option B, which is macroeconomics and finance. I have a question regarding this intra-EU settlement system. I'm actually wondering um, who decides or who decided on and who is part of it because you said that Italy left. Did, uh, Italy actually, how is it possible? So one country can actually leave within the EU or can Italy leave these uh, out of European uh, settlement treaties or investment treaties? Um, I'm also asking this question because I find it very peculiar because 
plan, I think, is tomorrow for the European Commission to present a plan how to actually implement these sustainable development goals until 2030. So they have this really this uh, interest, particularly with regards to the environment, what we talked about, to um, put this forward. And then on the other hand, we have the settlement cases also within European countries, between European countries, that actually really go against this. Louis? So thank you for your presentation first. So I'm Louis from Option B2, uh, Microeconomics and Finance, and I'm French. I just want to, I mean, the way I see these ISDSs, however obnoxious they may be, they are some kind of self-organized way to reduce policy risk on the part of companies. In the sense that, I mean, when some countries, for instance, Spain at the beginning of the 2010s, dropped its feed-in tariff policy in favor of renewables, and it completely hampered uh, its renewable, I mean, its green policy for 10 years now. It's barely starting over. So my question is, if we, I mean, we really don't want that kind of the, the present arrangements in terms of ISDS. So how would you imagine some kind of compensation mechanism for companies uh, in order to have a similar reduction in policy risk when investment, for instance, in renewables and stuff are needed, uh, either on the European or international scale? Thank you. In the case of, um, so it's it's only the investor that can sue the state, but at the international level, I don't know of any case where a state can sue an investor. It always happens at the national levels according to national rules, which is exactly why there's this UN conversations because there's no way, and this and and the third person that we always omit is the victims. It's also only the national level for the victims. There's no international level. And of course, I mean, it's for the, the state until to, to today to actually give um, the rules to respect to the investor. And, and it's also the state to decide on whether he, he respects it or not. So that's, that's the thing with, that's, that's the state of play until now. Maybe I confused you, maybe I wasn't clear. So there's, um, the Energy Charter Treaty is a bit different because it actually is not just the EU, it has a lot of countries around the world. It has mostly European countries, East and West, and now it's more and more going into Africa, but it's not um, a bilateral between two European countries. Sorry, maybe I wasn't clear enough. So the bilaterals between two, uh, Austria, Hungary, or Austria, Italy, this is, over, it's going to be over this year, it's in the process. But the Energy Charter Treaty, which has European Union but other countries inside, this is still part. This is still ongoing, and countries have left, like Italy. Um, and then this sunset clause, it's, it's quite common to have this clause where if the investment happened until the country was signatory, then you can sue for the 20 years that follows. It's common practice, but again, it's something that you can renegotiate and, and take away. In the, in the Energy Charter Treaty, you can't really renegotiate because then you have to take everyone on the table again to renegotiate. Um, the lack of coherence in the Commission it's, happens. It happens at the national level as well. Um, there clearly is a lot of differing views between DG Envy or DG DEFCO, which are the Departments for Environment and Devo uh, Development, which have been looking into the Sustainable Development Goals and DG Trade, which is the trade negotiators. Again, like uh, in a lot of national countries, uh, unfortunately until now it's DG Trade uh, that has to take the upper hand over this. And this contradiction is known inside. Uh, I know someone from DG LV that was very high up and that was working on investment, who actually resigned of uh, the new proposal. And that didn't, I mean, because he felt that inside from the GNV he couldn't make any change because trade always had the upper hand. And unfortunately, this is what happens a lot of time. I think internally at some point there's a minister or a department that has the upper hand. Um, in the case of Spain, Spain reduced its subsidies to the solar energy after the crisis. It reduced uh, phase by phase. It started in 2010 and then it, it, there were other phases. Um, there were investors that invested when Spain started reducing. And then when Spain reduced again, they sued. 
So they knew when they arrived that Spain was going to reduce, but they still they sued. So there, there's, you could think that it might have been done actually to get money out of Spain. And, I mean, obviously, if you lose money, you need to be compensated. But again, compensated for the money that you've lost. Why should Spain also pay for the profits you should have made? So you could reduce compensation. And this is something you could do easily in the treaty. You just take away future lost profit, and you take away indirect expropriation as a right. You, you renegotiate, you take this away, and then you, as an investor, only get the money for the money you've lost, which is what's happened at the national level. When you get compensated by the state, it's for the money that you're losing until the moment the state compensates. The state never compensates at the national level for the money that you should have got out of the investment. Hannah, I would like to comment something on your uh, question. I think, if I'm not completely wrong, this intro EU. Um, investment treaty, treaties, they were um, signed just before or when the European Union was like extended to, the, to Eastern Europe, is that right? That was the case and um, as, uh, as a uh, side fact, um, Austria was lobbied strongly against the abolishment of these inter eu um, treaties mainly because the Austrian banking sector but also Austrian industry is largely active in Eastern Europe countries. Eastern European countries, so there are within EU struggles. So we have uh, one more question, which is Matthäus, or not? Um, any other? Any other questions? It's time to finish because we need to do. I think. Okay, is it an important question or not? No. Good. Then. We have lunch. Yes, we should be on time. This is also true for all the professors. So um, I think we finish now. And thank you very much for this very interesting presentation and for this. Speech.